Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our first lecture for 2021. Happy New Year to all of you. I hope you're well and uh, you're keeping safe. My name is Dimitris Lumanis, and I'm one of the IIT Central London Network volunteers. This evening, I will be your virtual host and, and chair for the panel discussion. Traditionally, our events take place physically at the IIT Savoy Place, uh, but since COVID, the COVID pandemic, we have moved to an online program. I am supported tonight by my fellow volunteer, Xenophon Christodoulou, who will help us with the questions uh, Q&A session later on, and in case we run into any connection issues. Good evening, Xenio, and thank you for your help. Um, before we start, we'd like a quick poll just to see the, the audience that we have tonight with us. Um, I've, I had a look earlier on and I've noticed that the majority of you are indeed uh, members of the IAT. Uh, it's about 80%. So you're probably familiar with how we operate, um, what sort of a community volunteers we are. Um, but if you have any sort of questions, do feel free to share them at the um, Q&A um, section and uh, my fellow volunteers will respond to that. Um, <clears throat> so, have you ever attended one of our events previously? There's the first question for the evening. I would like to get your responses. And, uh, and we'll follow up with a couple of more questions and then we'll move on. Okay. Well, it seems that as expected, most of you have attended one of our events in the past. So you'll know that we're um, a group of volunteers that we kind of put engineering focused um, subjects, uh, lectures. Um, the next question was, are you presently in the UK or outside the UK? You will see that our audience, our, our panel members um, come from different countries and different time zones. So we're interested to, um, to hear your, um, your take on that. Again, the majority of you are in the UK, but there's a few outside the, outside the country. Um, so I believe we have one more question and apologies for the lag, the, the small lag. This is the uh, first time I'm, uh, I'm running one of these remote events. Uh, so bear with me while I familiarize myself. The third question um, is, how many of you are engineers uh, or technologists and, and how many of you are from the wider community? Um, and this will help our speakers then sort of target and, and, and change their responses to the questions that we'll be asking during the, uh, during the process. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a number of you who are not with, from our industry, which is good to know. Um, right, enough with the, with the polls for the time being. We have, we, we will move on to our event. Again, let me share the screen. So for tonight's event, The subject is technology transfer, addressing the challenges and accelerating opportunities for knowledge growth. Um, this is our first event for, for the year. And um, why do we decide to go with one of these events? We wanted to explore the field of technology transfer with the help of an excellent panel of speakers. The reason we decided to have that as our opening event for the year was because we, we see investment in innovation 
um, disruption and technology as one of the factors that will drive economic growth in the post-COVID era. Uh, so we reached out to experts from countries who are at the forefront of using R&D to drive the economy, like the UK and the United States, uh, but also to a government official from a country like Greece that aspires to do so over the next few years. So our guests will approach the subject from um, different perspectives covering the academic sector, central government, uh, startups and SMEs, but also from large corporate organizations. And I would like personally to thank all of them for taking time to, to speak to us tonight. So I will briefly um, introduce them and we will move straight on to the questions. We anticipate to have a bit less than an hour for the panel discussion. Uh, and then we will open the floor uh, for the audience for you to ask questions. Um, so I'll start with the way that they appear on my screen, which is incidentally uh, the alphabetical order. So our first guest for tonight is Professor Timothy Daforn from the University of Birmingham. He is the chair of the IT Innovation and Emerging Technologies Policy Panel and a professor of biotechnology at the university. Tim is also a serial entrepreneur, funding businesses in clinical diagnostics and instrument uh, development. In 2018, he was made chief entrepreneurial uh, advisor in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, where he advised on technology transfer and student entrepreneurship. Previously, in 2015, he held the position of Chief Scientific Advisor for the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. Good evening, Tim, and thank you for being here. Our next guest is Dr. Christos Dimas, who is the Deputy Minister of Development and Investments of the Greek government, responsible for research and technology. Dr. Dimas is a lawyer and a member of the Hellenic Parliament, who has been appointed at the Cabinet Office uh, since July 2019. Christos has strong links with the UK as he obtained an LLB degree from Queen Mary University and furthermore he completed his Master's in Comparative Politics at the LSE where he also finished his PhD in European Political Economy. During his studies he practiced journalism at the BBC and worked as the London correspondent of one of the Greek newspapers. He also taught at LSE and the University of Leicester, Leicester while before entering politics, Dr. Dimas worked as a, as a business consultant for the Boston Consulting Group. Kalispera, Minister Dimas. Our next guest for tonight is Elspeth Finch, and she's the founder and CEO of IANT, a technology platform designed for project teams to help them drive efficiently and deliver projects faster. Elspeth started her first technology business, Intelligent Space Partnership, at the age of 24, which she later sold to Atkins. She's, an active, she's active in shaping government's engineering policy with a focus on innovation and diversity through her work at the Royal Academy of Engineering, where she chairs the Innovators Group. Elspeth has also been recently appointed a member of the Innovation Expert Group, advising the Department for Business, Energy and Innovation on how to drive up the UK's productivity through innovation. She was recognized for her contribution to our sector by receiving an MBE for her services to engineering and enterprise in 2018, uh, 2017, apologies, amongst other prestigious awards. Good evening, Elspeth. And last but not least, we have Chrissy Tom with us tonight, who is a senior vice president responsible for growth strategy and solutions in Jacobs. She's a global connector accountable for future proofing Jacobs market excellence through people and technology transfer. Chrissy's 20 year career focuses on challenging what's next. Under her leadership, Jacobs strategically positions for growth and innovation by unlocking global intelligence to benefit customers. Her technical background is ecology, so systems thinking and integrated analysis are foundational to her approaches. 
Chris's experience with Jacobs spans across all businesses, operations, sales, project delivery, and solutions and technology. Good afternoon, Chris. So it's fascinating how modern technology enables us all to have a panel discussion in different time zones. And I, I'm very happy for that. This is probably one of the things that we wouldn't be able to do if we were back at Savoy Place. Right, with the introductions completed, we will move to the first question, which is actually one of, for you, the audience. Um, let's see how many of you are familiar with the subject of technology transfer. I should have asked that earlier on, uh, but apologies, I forgot. Can you see? Yes, you should be able to see now the, uh, the poll. It will obviously help how our speakers will approach the question, um, the questions that we ask them later on. Okay. So we have about 60% who are familiar with technology transfer and another 40 that are not team. So if you could go first then, answering to the audience, the simple question of what does technology transfer means to you? Thank you, Dimit Dimitris. Uh, I, a simple question. I'm not sure it is a simple question that technology transfer in itself is, and this is why we're talking about it today, is incredibly complicated. Um, so I'll try and simplify it and I'll give you a little, I think it's useful to give a bit of historical context. I'm getting to the age, I was 50 this year, that I've been able to take a historical context on things. I don't think I could before that. So as, a, as an innovator and an academic, I began um, developing things and coming up with things that I thought had applications when I was in Cambridge being a postdoc in 2000, um, 2001. And, and that really gave, 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 my experiences then give you an idea about te what technology, technology transfer was and what a lot of people think technology transfer is. So at that time, I had an idea and the university thought the idea had some value um, and decided that I had to go off and try and transfer that idea, that knowledge to an industrial entity in order to get it out there and to, and to generate economic value. And fundamentally, that was really the view of what technology transfer was. It was about um, a sort of one way street, if you like, of universities providing cutting edge ideas and and inventions that could then be shoved out with very little help um, into industry with a hope that it might do something. And it was quite a passive affair. Now, I think in the last 20 years, what we've seen is a real maturation of this and really began, I would say, strongly when we had the financial crisis. And at that point in the UK, Gordon Brown, who was our chancellor, turned around and said, what are we, where's, where, what are we getting for the money we're spending on all these university researchers doing great research? How is it benefiting the country? And crazily, no one had ever asked that question before. And it really caused a revolution in the UK, which is where technology transfer has broadened hugely. So I would say it, it, of course, involves the transfer of ideas. And in fact, that's accelerated hugely. So now, rather than an isolation of a university being an ivory tower and a company being you know, something which generates economic value, the two are much closer together. Um, and technology transfer has become a different word now. So we wouldn't call it technology transfer necessarily. We'd probably call it knowledge exchange to give a much broader view and also to ensure that you understand it's a two-way process. So what we see now by technology transfer, and this is where it gets very exciting, is a breaking down of those barriers between the two organisations. And just in terms of what moves backwards and forwards, what we see now moving backwards and forwards is, of course, ideas. But it's also things like access to expertise in both directions, access to um, apparatus, instrumentation and facilities, and, and access to, to people and personnel and training. And so we're getting a much more of a, of, a, of a seamless transfer of information between the two types of organization. And I think what's really exciting is you're getting to a stage now where it really is two way. So for I would say that is probably the most recent thing, which was very much push. And it was very much academic saying, we're really important. We've got great ideas. You guys have got to do something with it, which is, if you like, a bit insulting, because that more often than not, these things fail. 
because you come up and say this is an idea you should commercialize and the commercial guys go you don't understand what our problems are you don't understand what my customers need so now what we've got is a much more integrated we're beginning to get a much more integrated process where companies they call it pull now so companies will pull ideas out of universities it, it sounds a bit a bit confrontational actually it's about us understanding the challenges of the market something that university academics never did and understanding the challenges the problems and where there are issues and which might if solved unleash entirely new market sectors and that gives us challenges to go and uh, solve those problems and just as a final point this is really penetrating quite heavily into the university sector in the uk and just to give you an idea i have a very old colleague who's a well, very old is probably a bad thing to say but he's a mature colleague um, over the age of 70 who is a fellow of the royal society of the uk so he is one of the top one percent of scientists in the uk and it always told me i only do pure research tim i have no idea what you do why do you work with these businesses why are you why are you interested in this you should just be focusing on the pure stuff and one day young man you might become an frs and that was very much the view and then one day i put him in front of an um, an industrialist from a pharma company who and he was completely bored my well, my colleague until one moment where the industrialist said i have this problem and it is and the frs my colleague honoured professor said that's probably one of the most interesting questions anyone's asked me in the last 20 years and it spawned an entire area of research and a great connection so that's what i think technology transfer is i think it's a bringing together of the two things with a benefit to both because in the end and this is why i tell my colleagues in the university if an idea from a university goes to a business that business makes more money sadly it pays more tax with a bit of luck that tax goes to the government and if the government's feeling happy, that money comes back to us as grants to do more work, to produce more good ideas that the businesses can, can commercialise. So we're getting that cycle working through communication. That's my proposal for what I would say um, technology transfer or knowledge exchange is, Demetrius. Well, thank you very much. That's a very uh, interesting introduction. And I will turn to Kirsty now. Um, you know, Chris, do you agree with Tim's definition and, and how do large corporate companies approach technology transfer? Yeah, Dimitri and, and Tim, I completely agree with, with how you've teed it up. So, um, you know, this, this move toward, toward collaboration and toward diversity of thought has only enhanced and actually I would argue has been an imperative to adapting to the world we live in today, which is changing and cycling over in terms of technology advancement in a much more rapid way. And so I think for, for any, any piece and part of this, this uh, you know, ecosystem, if you will, from university to laboratory, government, you know, whatever it is to, to the corporation like, like, like I represent, th there's a sense that, that our our, our goals and our priorities may be slightly different depending on, you know, where, what entity we're associated with, but combining together leads to, leads to, I would say, I would argue a faster pace of play and also the ability to go farther. So farther and faster together. And so from a business perspective, for me, that's what my clients are looking for from me, regardless of the sector they're in, whether they're public, private, you name it. We, we are here to add value and to anticipate a rapidly changing world. And so however I do that as a business, um, you know, it's really up to me to, to leverage all the tools and, and all the resources that I possibly can to go faster for my clients. And so like you said, having that, that focus from a university and not waiting until the paper is out and peer reviewed and published to engage with, with those um, uh, you know, industry experts, with those, with those university experts, academic experts, and combining them with folks that might be more applied and more, more on the, the, uh, the um, industry side of it together, having those conversations earlier tends to lead to better outcomes is what I've observed. So thinking about it from an agile mindset, right? We don't want to go through a big, long, expensive process to come up with um, you know, a minimum viable product or a product that at the end of the day, you know, yeah, it would have been great had it been released two years ago, but now it's too late. We wanna go fast. 
but we also want to just keep testing, keep experimenting, make sure that we are adapting with the changing needs around us too. Great, thank you for that. Um, any other panelists would like to have a, a go at that or you all agree with uh, Chris and Tim and we'll move on to the next question. I see you all agree, good. Well, the next one is then, um, so we're picking up on the topic of tools and support for startups and spin-offs, university spin-offs now. Um, so I turn to Elspeth uh, with a question, what are the tools and, and support startups like yours need to thrive in a competitive environment? Um, thank you, Dimitris. And I definitely agree with the points by um, Tim and Chrissy as well. Um, I think I'm going to answer this from two perspectives. I'm going to talk about my personal experience, but also I chair a startup competition for young entrepreneurs. So I'm going to say a few things that I hear from them as well. Um, for me, there's they're really about two things. They're about money and about people. And so I'm going to say five things which really for me are critical. Um, the first is access to market. No company can thrive without clients. This is about clients who are willing to buy new services or from new companies. And this is not about free pilots and hackathons. It is people who are actually willing to purchase and invest in new solutions. It's also having the clients as being collaborative partners, sharing the problems and working together to deliver an end solution to an end client. And for me, that's absolutely key. I think the second piece is it's always about skill team and about access to expertise. And actually having things like the new digital technologies are such a, make such a difference because my team is working internationally at the moment. So, you know, we do need to be able to have the right tools to do that. Um, I think the third is around investment and support. Um, everything from things like the R&D tax, um, investors, you need that upfront capital to be able to start developing products. Um, you also need for me, and this is quite personal, you need a support network. You need the ecosystem to help, to provide advice, mentoring, support. Um, one of the things which I find is very important as being, I was an entrepreneur in my early 20s and I'm now an entrepreneur in my 40s. You need very different skills at different ages as well. So the people that I'm looking for for support are different than the ones I needed in my 20s. So it's really understanding that customization of the support networks you require. And then I think the fifth for me is around the infrastructure. And one of the big changes for me from when I did my first startup in my 20s is having things like AWS. So the fact that there's so much digital infrastructure that enables us to collaborate remotely, that we can build products fast. We've got that digital infrastructure, which enables us to work fast, quickly, and with a high quality of delivery makes a huge difference. And so for me, it's around making sure we have both the skills, the money, the people all together is really the kind of infrastructure that helps startups thrive. Um, that's from my personal perspective. I think one other thing I'd say is because I sort of chair a startup competition for the Enterprise Hub at the Royal Academy of Engineering called Launchpad. And one of the things which has been so fundamental there, and that really connects the network piece that I was talking about, is really pairing very early stage entrepreneurs in their early 20s to people who've been through through that process before, so that they can learn from that experience, they can have access to the networks of investors, because it's really hard, especially if you come from a minority group, to be able to actually access the people with that capital, or even know how to pitch to an investor. So I think it's these networks for me are absolutely critical. And I think that's where people like the IT and our sort of our industry networks play a really critical role. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Elspeth. I guess we'd like to now see, um, you know, the, the government's viewpoint on this. So we'll turn to Deputy uh, Minister Dema for that. But before answering the question, um, I know that you recently launched the Elevate Greece uh, gateway to the Greek eco innovation system, um, or to the Greek innovation ecosystem, uh, which I think will probably feature in your response. So I'd like to briefly share with our audience the video of that launch first. Um. It all starts with powerful ideas. That elevate people to reach their greatness. And shape the world with innovation and creativity. Elevate Greece is the gate to the innovation ecosystem, comprised of startups, 
investors and community builders with passion, talent, knowledge, and the commitment to create a better future. Elevate Greece is the place we build the startups of tomorrow. Because where opportunity calls, the innovators step in to shape a better world with new technology and disruptive ideas. Be where progress is being engineered. For everyone. By you. There's never been a more exciting time to explore the Greek startup community. Join now the Greek innovation ecosystem, Elevate Greece. Okay, so Deputy Minister, could you please share with us what the government incentives uh, that have been offered are to support the innovation ecosystem and technology transfer? Yes, uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank uh, the uh, Institution of Engineering and Technology for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, why Elevate Greece? Um, we didn't know how many startups we have, in which sectors they were operating, how many people they employed, uh, what budgets they had. And even if we wanted to legislate uh, incentives for the startup ecosystem, in reality, we didn't know who they were. So we started uh, looking at best practices of other countries and we saw that uh, because it's very difficult to define uh, exactly what a startup is. Uh, there isn't a, a one single uh, international definition. Uh, so we saw that in some cases, uh, creating a, a national startup registry was very useful. Uh, this allows the government to map the Greek startup ecosystem to monitor progress through specific uh, KPIs, to uh, help through networking, mentoring, job offers, news announcements, uh, or even matchmaking events. Uh, and uh, also it allows us to address local and global investors that might be business angels, venture capital funds, or big corporates. And it even gives us the opportunity to uh, take initiatives, uh, measures, that are tailor-made for the Greek ecosystem. In fact, we have announced recently, although Elevate Greece has been functioning only uh, for two months now and, and is growing day by day, uh, we have announced a, a, a measure uh, where we will help all of the startups uh, of Elevate Greece um, with, uh, with the liquidity due to the COVID crisis. But we also uh, legislated very recently incentives uh, for the angel investors. We have simplified the procedure for the creation and functioning or even the shutting down of, uh, of spin-offs, which is extremely important for us. Uh, take into account that Greece has a very good uh, academic performance uh, when compared uh, internationally, but where we do lag behind is in innovation and we lag behind not because we don't have the human capital, uh, the people or the ideas. Actually, we have uh, plenty of Greeks in, uh, in extremely important positions in, in uh, global companies or in, in very important positions in universities and academia, but we didn't have the, the, uh, the environment in order to give the opportunity uh, to, start, to, to startups to, to flourish within the country. Uh, so we are now trying to, to link academic research with entrepreneurship, with innovation much more effectively. Uh, that's why we are funding uh, the support and strengthening of technology transfer offices uh, with 30 million euros in order to allow universities and research centers to employ specialized personnel that will assist scientific ideas to become products and services. I, I really liked uh, uh, Timothy's uh, definition about uh, knowledge exchange rather than uh, technology transfer. Uh, we are also funding uh, patents uh, to a significant percent, uh, the function of, of competence centers. Uh, we're investing 30 million euros on that. 
the creation of innovation clusters. And also we, we have been financing projects that help link research uh, with entrepreneurship much more effectively. Finally, uh, we are also trying to give important incentives to, to companies that already uh, have R&D expenses uh, in the country, but also make Greece more attractive for new R&D investments. And that way, that's why we uh, recently uh, increased uh, the tax incentive, the main tax incentive, which is uh, uh, the super deduction tax rate for R&D expenses, which we increased from 130% to 200%, uh, therefore making Greece much more attractive for our R&D uh, investments. And in fact, I, I don't want to say, uh, closing with this uh, final comment, that uh, we have attracted important companies uh, in the last one year, ranging from Microsoft, EY, Pfizer, uh, and uh, other important companies, uh, Amazon more recently. Uh, and we, we do believe that uh, it's the time that Greeks should have the opportunity to, to flourish their ideas within the country as well. Thank you, Christo. And Elspeth, do you recognize some of the UK government incentives there in what Christos was just describing to us? Mute. That's a rookie mistake in 2021 to still have the uh, mute button on. I don't think there's any excuse for that. Um, anyway, I definitely recognize a number of the things that Christos has said. Um, I, and I think, Tim, I might also bottle on you on this question, if there's any that I've missed, so please do chip in. Um, when I think about what's happening in the UK to support sort of tech transfer, to support entrepreneurs, um, there's a number of different things government's doing. So one of which is there's direct funding, and that's from things like Innovate UK, but also things like the British Business Bank for things like the Future Fund, and also how they've been funding the investors who then can invest in startups. Um, as well as things like the Knowledge Transfer Network, which does what it says in the tin for knowledge exchange. There's also um, a big change that's been made relatively recently around procurement and around the government regulations around UK procurement. Um, and one of the new regulations came out, it's part of what's called the Social Values Act. Um, it was only, the new regulation only was drafted in September. It became live in the 1st of January. And that's called, it's got new regulations, which mean that for government procurement and central government procurement, it's called PPN 0620. It's got a very snappy title. But what it means is that for new procurement, you've got to review innovation, spend on SMEs, spend on, spend on startups and social enterprise, as well as the locations where those companies come from to really support the leveling up agenda and post COVID recovery. Um, so those are two. I think there's a third, which is around tax, which obviously, Christos, you were talking about as well. So for things like the R&D tax, both credits for basically for companies that are loss making to help them with their cash flow, as well as basically tax uh, rebates for the companies who are in um, who are profitable. You've also got the um, tax regimes around EIS and SEIS, which support the angel investments in these small investment funds to basically de-risk the investment in startups. And that's been absolutely critical to growing the startup community. Um, one of the things which um, sort of the Innovation Expert Group came out of as part of was the UK's R&D Roadmap, which is published this summer. I'd say that's got a very strong focus on technology transfer and also things like horizontal innovation. So it'd be useful to, for those who are interested to look at that. And then from a network side, you've obviously got things like the catapult centres to really help forge co contacts between government, um, industry and startups. That's, I suppose, my quick summary. Tim, are there any key ones that I've missed? No, I think you've done brilliantly. I mean, the, the EIS, SEIS has been, was revolutionary and made a massive difference. It, it enables those investments that you need at the early stage. And the R&D tax credits, from my own experience of the business, are, are fundamentally important. We wouldn't still be here without those. And it gives you a real um, advantage in many ways. I think the other two things, so I, while I was, when I was working in government, we did a retrospective look at the last 10 years of in, interventions from government into the economy, which was something which it was very interesting. And there, was a, there were two things which were quite Quite, which came out of it which were also quite interesting one was for those high growth companies and there was a big push a little while ago about identifying your high growth companies these are the ones that are really going to get you know global size 
um, there was an org- there was a um, a, a government um, method called the growth accelerator, which really took them on as individuals and pushed them hard. Now that's a little bit of a copy of what happens in in Ireland and in Denmark, who use these sorts of things. So you have the general growth, and then you also make some bets on the ones that are going to go well, and you put government really close support behind those. And that 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 showed a ten to one recovery of tax versus investment which is the best that a government's ever done so that was a really nice route um and and, and the other one which i would always stand on is, in, is is encouraging education so that feed in of people underneath i'm sure that's the same in greece as well that you know getting those bright young things as they come through when they're not risk averse like i am because i've got a mortgage and they want to give it a go and making sure that they have that support and the, the tools to do it we identified uh, four years ago, four or five years ago, the biggest problem with early stage startups is the lack of management um, training and their inability to run a company. So giving them that as a tool, I think you, that really helps as, as well. And the government's um, put some quite significant policy back uh, backing behind that in the, in the past couple of years. So I think you got it all pretty much, Elspeth. So just one thing i just add to that, Tim, if that's okay, Demetrius, I'm trying not to. Yeah, by all means. Um, is the, there's one other point, which I think the Scale Up Institute is, was founded to help support Scale Up because we're quite good at the res- early research and development. We're less good at the scaling up of companies. So the Scale Up Institute is there to support basically Scale Up organizations who are plus a million, they're growing 20 percent year on year plus. One of the things in their annual report that they did last year, and they do a very good deep dive every year around the scale up state of the nation, is it's a reminder that a number of the technology companies and the fast growing technology companies, they're not necessarily new and they're not necessarily run by people who are young. So they can be existing companies that have started to really accelerate in terms of their in terms of their scale. And I think one of the things when we're thinking about technology transfer is we shouldn't forget about the medium-sized businesses and the businesses which have been around for a few years who have, are also a really critical part of our ecosystem. Okay. So with um, having talked about the tools and, and support that we want for you know, spin-offs and, and startups, um, I guess the next field to cover would be the challenges and opportunities. And for our audience, if you recall, you know, the, 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 the title of our event was Challenges and Opportunities um, for Technology Transfer. So I'd like to turn to Chrissy this time and, and ask um, what are the challenges that you have seen in technology transfer? And what are the accelerating opportunities for knowledge flow? Tim covered knowledge earlier on in his. So especially in 2020, you know, how did COVID change things? Yeah, Dimitri, thanks for that question. And it, it actually relates to, to a question that, that came in the Q&A from, from Mark, and, and maybe we'll, we'll address that, that head on, um, at, at least, at least in, in part to, with my answer, and then um, we can come back to that when you're ready. Um, you know, in terms of which, which entities might be most aligned to to collaborate, and how do we how do we really have that consortium to lead to the best outcome? Um, in terms of uh, um, you know uh, doing more and, and progressing. In terms of the challenges with with technology transfer, from from my perspective, and again, kind of from a from a, a we'll call it a large company perspective. Um, Something, something that, that particularly for the role that I serve in the business, I'm a connector, I'm a global connector. The reason why they have a role like mine is because unless we're able to harness and, and integrate that collective intelligence across the organization, we might have a pocket of brilliance and excellence in, on one part of the globe. But if that's not connected to opportunities and and uh, you know clients in another part of the globe that might be going on the same path that might might be able to leverage that that approach that process that that technology whatever it is then then as a global company we're 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 not optimized so so my whole role is about how we connect the good ideas in an efficient and and routine. Um, uh, cadence. So we'll call it accessibility. So a big, a big challenge that I see in my organization in terms of technology transfer that, that we have long organized around to address is that accessibility. Um, you know, it's also recognizing that 
um, you know, we, we, also, we also can't be everything to everybody. And I think that does speak to Mark's question. So as a business, and, and particularly depending on your business acumen and kind of what, you know, what, what management training you've had. Um, and I know for me, with my own academic background, I love learning. I love diving in deep to, um, you know, really research a topic, see where it goes. As a business, we have to be disciplined about how that carries forward. What is the, the, the why behind it? What problem are we solving for our clients? Where is it going? And so, um, you know, when it comes to some of the challenges, it's also about focus for our organization. And one way, a big way that we're able to do that is with technology transfer and bringing in partners that, that we share values with, that we share ethics with, that we can trust to collaborate with, um, you know, whether that's a startup that, that does have that focus, you know, maybe it is on, you know, that, that tech development aspects, you know, maybe that's a good idea, but, you know, having those partners that do what they do best and bringing them together, that system is, is where we really start to see success for, for us as a business. So, um, you know, that's both some of the, the, the main barriers and, and challenges that, that I know we face as a company. Um, you know, the, the other one, the other challenge that, that is more something to manage is compliance. So, you know, I actually, you know, in preparation for the panel, I was starting to review a few of our, um, our, our compliance um, uh, slide decks that we train our staff with to make sure that we are complying with the policies in the security and, and the export protection, you know, from, from all the countries that we work in. So it's making sure that, that we are um, respecting and, and doing what we need to do as a business to, to fit in to the strategy of the home country. So, um, you know, it's something that um, you know, we, we intentionally manage and, and draw attention to from, from our, um, our teams as well as our partners. Um, moving on to the COVID part of your question, um, I don't think me and my company are unique in saying that there's, that things have, have shifted, they've shifted. And that's not just due to the, pan to, due to the pandemic. There's, there's some uh, interconnected variables, you know, thinking about climate change, thinking about geopolitical. Things don't stop just because we have a pandemic. And I think we've all seen that. And so, you know, what we've been able to do is, is talk to our clients, stay close to our clients, understand what's changing, what their new priorities are. And those might be changing on an hourly and daily basis. And it's our job to, to stay attuned to that as we address it. So, um, you know, it, and that combined with, with personal challenges and just recognizing that for a lot of our team members, um, you know, and Elspeth talked about this, it's actually a silver lining for us that 90% that of our 55,000 employees are now fully working from home. And, you know, it's something that um, was, was always in our strategy but that from a cultural change standpoint and a behavioral change standpoint was going to take, we thought it would take a lot longer to get everybody used to working a different way, being able to leverage this. But it's been, I'll tell you, it's been a great equalizer across our company um, because instead of expecting to work shoulder to shoulder in an office with folks, um, you know, the people on the phone now are everybody. It used to be the people on the phone might have had had a bit of a, a limitation in terms of what they could contribute. Everybody's everybody's remote now, and I've seen the improvement in the collaboration that I think we can really carry forward as a result of COVID. Um, you know, from a, from a client perspective, and you know, that's allowed us to actually we've we've got an empirical model that we collaborated with um, University of Cambridge and, and others in terms of a peer review and, and Highways England to. Um, produce this model that, you know, rapidly helps our clients to make decisions about, you know, how do we keep staff safe? How do we have business continuity during this time when things are rapidly changing? And the only way we're able to do that is by this collaboration and making sure that we have other organizations with different focuses that we can trust to make sure that this is credible and that we've produced it in a rapid manner 
And so that's been another silver lining for us. And, you know, we've got other examples like that, but, but, you know, with the COVID pandemic, we've all had to pivot quickly. And I'd say technology transfer and the fact that we did have those previous relationships and trusted um, uh, cadences with these outside organizations has only made us more resilient during this time. And I would agree that uh, COVID has been an accelerator in changing uh, cultures and mentality in companies for sure. And also helping us uh, meet climate change um, uh, targets that we all have with less traveling. Uh, but I mean, turning to team now with, with both hats on, you know, the academic, but also the company non-executive one. What is your take on the challenges and opportunities ahead? I mean, I think in terms of the COVID side of things and the general challenges going forwards and the opportunities, I think Chrissy hit the nail on the head here. I think we've good technology transfer and if you like gaining economic value out of new ideas is about speed. And I think Chrissy's mentioned this several times and a reduction in speed is caused by barriers. And what we've seen is almost all of the barriers that we previously thought were there have gone. I mean, just to give you an example, we, we, we launched a COVID test last week, which we developed in the lab five minutes it's the fastest there is in the world now normally that would have been to get that out would have been a conversation which would have taken six months so what's happened the last week is we have 35 interested parties universities working on all the agreements across the world they range from australia all the way through to the us to us and there's no question all the meetings are online the thing with the test was developed across the globe anyway. And, and I think people are just thinking that way. And that what that means is there's a real opportunity, I think, for both universities and, and industry that you can get the best. And the best is, you know, to, to do your project. And it may not be that the best is in Harvard or in Cambridge. The best might be in University of Pretoria, but you can now access them really easily. So I think in terms of universities and the overall of tech transfer, I think the, ex, the acceleration of innovation is going to happen and we've had it forced. I have to say as a biologist, generally international um, global catastrophes lead to variation and new ideas. And so that's that's what happens in evolution. I think that's what we're seeing in the business. Just quickly on the other side, I think businesses, so my view is only as a small startup and it really, really depended upon, in terms of the COVID stuff, it depended upon where you were in your funding cycle. I'm sitting pretty on a new investment which happened about a month before COVID. So we're sitting there happily, all our staff aren't around, so we're losing out on market traction, but we're actually sitting there. So I think that's been a different thing and that's very hard. So it depends upon where you are. Lots of companies have gone to the wall and we will have wasted intellectual capital because if those companies have gone to the wall, then the intellectual capital often dissipates. It can't be bought on in the traditional way, which it is when it's jumped between company, between company, those companies are just gone. And that's the real sadness. And we will never know what that has cost us overall. But the bright thing is I think COVID overall is going to lead to much more innovation, much more slickly and, and many more opportunities. Thanks for that. And congratulations on the big achievement with the vaccination, uh, with, the, with the COVID uh, testing. So just yes, turning to Crystal now and going back to the challenges a little bit. Um, is failure a good thing? What can we learn from it? Uh, I will start by, by stating the obvious. Nobody wants to fail. Okay. Uh, so uh, when, when you start any initiative, uh, especially if that has to do with the uh, business, but in, in our everyday life, Nobody starts by, by saying that I want to fail. However, uh, I will go back to what my mother used to tell me when I was much younger. Uh, it's that every obstacle is there for a good purpose. The real question that we have to ask is if we are actually ready to learn from, from our mistakes. Uh, I, I, will, I will now go back to what uh, an ancient Greek poet uh, has said, Menander. Which, if I had to translate, means that to do the same mistake twice is not a distinct, distinctive feature of a wise man. So uh, when, when you actually fail, uh, you must be capable of actually learning from your mistakes, uh, adapting uh, your new ideas in order not to fail again. Uh, that is good in theory, it's much more difficult in, in practice, but uh, because there is a mentality, there is a very strong mentality in, in Greece, and I, I do need to, to state it, that if, if you fail in your first initiative, uh, it's considered bad. Uh, 
in in other countries, and I can definitely think of Israel at least. Uh, if if you fail in your first initiative, it's it's not a good thing. But as long as you learn from your experience and you adapt uh, your new initiative uh, in order not to fail at least for the same reason, then, then it's it might be a useful lesson. So if I had to answer, nobody wants to fail. Fail is not uh, failure is not. Uh, 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 something that we would like to see, but we must in 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 the real world, you must be able to learn from your mistakes and not repeat them in the future. Thank you, Christo. Um, Elspeth, from a SME point of view, you know how is failure? Is there a good thing? What can you learn from it? Because obviously, you know it has a financial implication. So, so I think the, I'm going to sort of try and put together a few threads. So I think if you're building a new business and you've got a new idea, there is a fundamental risk of failure and you need to be aware of that from the outset. And it's not just you who needs to be aware of it. The people around you need to be aware of it. I know that when I left Atkins to set up IAN, people went, of course it was going to be successful because you've done it before. And that's not true because it's a different type of business. It's a different type of product. And there will always be, a, there's always a risk of failure. I think for me, it's about understanding the risk envelope that you're working in and understand how you can be a learning organization to minimize the risk that you're taking. And I think for me, learning organization is fundamental and Christos, I'd absolutely agree with everything that you've said. So I think for me, one of the things that I would really recommend to people is to use tools such as retrospectives. We use them all the time. A retrospective is a structured way where you can learn and you say what's gone well that you can take forward, what's gone wrong that you can change, and what new things should we do next time. And we do that as a structured way at the end of product sprints and a way of other doing success sprints so that we can make sure that what we do, we're constantly learning and evolving as an organization. I think also as part of that, when things fail, and you'll always have lots of small failures, whatever size of organization that you're in. So it could be that you're doing a marketing campaign that hasn't hit its traction. It could be a new product feature doesn't get the adoption that you expect. It's really trying to understand the root cause of that failure to make sure that you don't make that same mistake again. But it's not always in your control. So the products can fail because regulations have changed or market conditions have changed. Or if you are launching a new restaurant and COVID hit, your restaurant may have failed because of the market conditions that you're in. So I think it's making sure that you can understand that risk. And I also think the other thing when we think about failure, and I think coming on to Chris's comment around compliance, is also understanding what things you should not be failing in. So if you're making promises to clients, those are promises that you can't fail in. So it's understanding the envelope in which you're making promises and the envelope in which you can accept or not manage risk and failure. So it's a slightly different approach I've taken to risk, but hopefully that makes it interesting. Mm, definitely. Um, looking at the watch, I'm gonna quickly move to the next uh, topic so we can cover as many as we can before we move into the Q&A from the audience. And is the subject of knowledge. So we're going back to knowledge that Tim covered in his response earlier on. And it's a question for you this time, Tim. Who should own university research based it's especially when it is funded through central government and other public sector um, support funds. And I think it's a hot topic question. It certainly is. I mean, I was saying, to Dimitri, we talked about this before. I, I, I said my view when I was giving a talk in Brazil some years ago, and I almost had to be escorted out by uh, security guards. I mean, as a person who invents, you want the idea to be your own, of course, because you're proud of it, you have ownership, but it's more complicated that, than that. And in every country, it's complex. So in the UK, which is really my perspective, the ownership resides with the university. There's a contract of employment, which means that all your IP and all the ideas that you have, even if you have an idea and you shared in the evenings, is related to your work, then the university owns it all and, and controls that. And that's complex because actually, if you think about it, in most cases, the university didn't pay for the research. The research is inevitably paid for by the government and therefore paid by taxpayers. So do the taxpayers owe it, own it? Does the government own it? Do you own it as the person who had the idea? You know, what is important? And, and I think there's a, there's a, it's a really complicated answer. And I don't think there's a single answer. 
where I think it probably lays is the, the, the ownership should be owned by or should be controlled by the person who's actually going to make it happen. I mean, just to give you an example, we set up a spin-out company some, time, some years ago, our idea, a couple of academics, and by the time I've got to the end of my funding rounds, I, at the moment I own 0.1% of the company or something ridiculous. So my interest in continuing doing it has diminished because the reward isn't coming. So I think you've got to be very careful. And, and I think you have to be dynamic. You send, you know, in some cases, universities own the IP, some places, um, some countries, the government takes a part of the IP. I think in the end, when something is thought of having value, everybody wants a bit of it. But if you then ask the question, who's going to get that value out of it, everybody walks away. So I think that's why the answer is to try and provide the ownership of the IP as far as possible with the person who's going to take it forwards. I mean, inevitably, it will be owned by the VCs to a certain degree. But that's what I would say. Thanks for your honesty and uh, good response there. Um, moving on to Chrissy then, uh, how does Jacob's op approach open source material, which is kind of linked with the uh, knowledge sector field? Yeah, and this is this is something that that has been evolving, um, you know, over the last decade in particular. So just th thinking about the the massive quantity of data that's available. Um, those who can harness that data and analyze that data and, and find ways to, to ensure that that data can, can produce meaningful um, information for decision making are those that will continue to add value and drive in terms of, you know, how we think about it from a business perspective. So, um, you know, I think, and actually this builds on, on Elspeth's comments about the risk envelope. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, in the company, you know, it used to be that, you know, companies tended to be fairly close in terms of trade secrets, in terms of, um, you know, how close we kept our innovations and our, um, you know, R&D approaches because we were nervous about, um, you know, competitors getting ahead of us or something like that. that that's really an outdated mindset, in my opinion. Um, you know, I think we, we have to understand that, that, you know, data is, is there, it's available. It's just, you know, who has the expertise and the analytics to make use of it. And so when it comes to open source, that's, you know, that, that is part of our challenge is to make sure that, um, you know, when we're, when we're delivering, you know, we are ensuring that, that, that any data sources that we leverage, you know, are first, we're complying from a regulatory perspective, but also that they, um, they meet a certain level of quality. And, and that's a big deal when it comes to how we leverage open source and how we make decisions about whether to invest in, um, you know, data sets or, or, you know, tools that, that either we custom build or that we partner with somebody else to, to build that aren't necessarily readily available. But there's a lot of value in, in leveraging open source because of the vast quantities of data that can sit with it and the power that that um, can be harnessed for our clients in terms of how they make decisions, how they think about things like predictive analytics, you know, I guess one more point on that is, you know, we're a professional services firm. We do a lot of different things, but when it comes to, we'll take the construction industry as an example. So think about it from an industry perspective, the construction industry, there's so much opportunity to do more there. And if we're all holding on to our data and, and you know, just thinking that we have, we have the ability to keep everything, um, behind a firewall, I, I think that's a misnomer. Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's certainly exceptions to that on, on the defense side in, in particular, but where we can leverage data and, and um, leverage tools from an open source perspective for, um, you know, the benefit of more, you know, again, is going to allow us to, to do more in a shorter period of time. So from, a, from, from my company's perspective, and I think from a lot of companies in my industry's perspective, um, we see open source as, as another um, avenue to, to harness um, um, increased, uh, increased power for our clients to do more. 
Yeah, I think the knowledge um, topic can can we can debate on it for uh, quite some time. But conscious of the time, I want to ask a couple of more questions: uh, one to Christo and one to Elspeth, uh, and then we can move on to Q and A, and we'll get back to it if we have time afterwards. So this is a, a question for you, Elspeth, on diversity, and um, is diversity important for innovation? And how can you make how can it make a difference to innovation? Okay, so I'm going to talk about, so I think it is absolutely fundamental and I'd say it's a completely founding principle for my company, I and. Um, for me, it's because if you're wanting to create an, a diverse and inclusive culture, you know, how can you build a new product that will work for everybody if you don't have a team who are representative of everybody. So it is very, very hard to make that right. Um, you also need to make sure all voices will be heard. Both people are willing to speak and will be heard. And you need to make sure that all ideas are embedded in your ideas. So for me, it's, so there's a bit around making sure you're building the right product and you need a diverse team to do that. I think the second thing for me on a personal side is it's really exciting to work in an environment with people of different ages, cultures, and backgrounds. You create better ideas, you're better at managing risk, you learn new skills, and you're creating an environment where people thrive. And for me, that is really exciting. Um, I'd also say as a cautionary note, there are a number of examples of products where they have not been built with diverse teams. A uh, recent one is pulse oximeters, which don't work if you are black you've got much higher risk related to the accuracy of the oxygen levels. There are hand dryers that don't work if you're black because they weren't tested with people from diverse cultures. There are a number of examples of or crash test dummies, which until very recently were all basically tested in a male body, which meant the seat belts weren't positioned for the female form. So when we're starting to think about a diverse team, better ideas, but also we need to reduce the risk about not creating groupthink, which creates risk in the products that we create. Okay, and uh, Deputy Minister, uh, for you, the same question basically on, on diversity, and if you could um, perhaps also name investment in Greece that you're currently looking at or, or perhaps planning. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a practical problem I had to deal when I uh, first became Deputy Minister. So we established the National Council for Research and Innovation, which we decided it would be a 15 member body, uh, which would actually consult, uh, excuse me, would actually advise the government uh, on the direction of policy reforms needed in order to strengthen research and uh, innovation. So uh, the, the question we had uh, was uh, who to actually include and uh, my decision was that, first of all, for the first time in, in Greece, we needed uh, 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 people that were both from academia and from the business sector. So it was extremely important to include in, in the council uh, people from, uh, from the market. So from the 15 members, 10 are from academia, 5 are from the business sector. Uh, another another uh, issue was... Uh, uh, how many would be from uh, applied sciences and how many from uh, humani humanities, for example. And uh, in that case, out of the 10 academics, it, it was eight from applied sciences, but we, we did have uh, academics from humanities as well. Then, of course, the obvious question, uh, men and women, and we did want a gender-balanced uh, uh, council, so we've got eight men and seven women. Uh, another issue was uh, because we have many Greek <coughs> academics we have many Greek academics uh, who are in universities outside Greece and we didn't want to exclude them because uh, they might have something to share uh, from their experience, which would be extremely valuable. So we, we do have uh, three academics from uh, universities outside Greece. And uh, we also have people from uh, uh, various ages. So diversity is extremely important in, uh, even in, uh, in, uh, uh, in in regards of uh, government planning uh, for uh, for research and uh, innovation, and not only for research and innovation, I would I would say that for all policy sectors, um, you also asked me, Dimitris, though about uh, an investment that we have. 
uh, we, we noticed 15 months ago that uh, there was absolutely no planning in Greece uh, about a physical ground, uh, an infrastructure of, a, of an innovation district. So a physical ground where startups, spin-offs, uh, R&D of, a, of a big corporations or uh, even local corporations would, uh, would have as a matchmaking ground uh, in order to create synergies, uh, innovative products and, and services. So we, we found an, uh, an extremely nice area uh, in, uh, in Athens. Uh, it actually used to be a, 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 an area of uh, medical and chemical innovation in, in the previous century, uh, but uh, was unused since the late 1980s. Uh, and uh, we are uh, transforming it into a modern into innovation district. And tender was actually published uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and we hope that uh, starting in 2022, uh, the construction will, will, uh, will start and it will become the natural ground of, uh, of research and innovation in Greece and Southeastern Europe. Great. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, sounds very exciting. Um, right. So I have more questions to ask, but I'd like to move on to uh, audience questions. So they, we, we get uh, as much time as we can to, to uh, get questions from our audience tonight. Zen, have you picked up a few of them? Well, we allocate them to speakers. Can you hear me, Dimitris? Yeah. Excellent. So we had quite a few relating to um, the topic of uh, how is Brexit creating opportunities and challenges in technology transfer? So what does the panel think? Uh, Brexit, uh, which has now happened, of course, is going to affect technology transfer. And are there any opportunities uh, that can be taken? And we go with Tim first then on that. Thanks, Demetrius. That's really kind of you. <laughs> I, do you know what? I think it's too early to tell. I mean, we don't know the position. So as academics, we don't know the position we have within the European Framework Funding Programme. Um, so that's, but that's not, that, and that allows us entry into programmes that also have strong elements of collaboration with industry because the EU programme's always been really good at that. So at the moment, we're really uncertain and always with uncertainty. So the last job I had before I left the government was actually to go around and talk to small businesses about Brexit. At the time, I didn't realise I was the only member of the government doing that. Every, all the other people had hidden. Uh, um, and, and, and I think the biggest worry they had, and this is the counter to what we're saying about COVID, was barrier formation. And we know that. And that is the concern and barrier formation prevents innovation. So in terms of my worries, my worries are mostly around whether I will still be able to easily innovate and transfer technology, exchange technology with my European colleagues in their countries. So I think it's that that's my real worry at the moment. Um, but I think it's really too early to tell. I mean, I've, I was I, I was contacted by a student recently from from um, from Italy who wants to come for work for me and from a business. And it, I, I can't say to her yes or no at the moment. So I think until we know that, it's a little unclear, which is not a great answer, I know. Well, uh, Elspeth wants to uh, have a go at it, and then we'll come to Christa as well. Okay, so a couple of things. So one of the things is that, which one thing is just stayed the same as some of the data transfer, and I think, especially coming to Chris's point, is really fundamental. Um, I think, certainly being from the construction infrastructure sector, I think we have some really strong links with people like Singapore, which obviously continue, and although we've got, so I think there's a piece which is looking at how some of those relationships can continue, I'd also say, um, come from having worked in the large enterprise, and I'm going to pick on Chrissy for a quick second, is I actually think that there's a really important role for the organizations who work across, who are global companies, who have got a really good bridgehead opportunity to help maintain technology transfer in a way that perhaps didn't happen before. And uh, Christo, you wanted to add something? Yes. Um... When uh, Dimitris, you showed the, the, the first poll, uh, which the question was, uh, are you in the UK or elsewhere? Uh, I uh, immediately thought that it's the wrong question. The question should have been, are you in Europe uh, or not? Uh, and 
I, I, I don't know how uh, anyone would actually understand the question and what uh, type of mixed results would, uh, would have. Uh, I'm, I'm just kidding on that, but uh, I'm, 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 I'm not British, obviously, okay? I'm, I'm Greek, but I, I have lived in the UK and I, I truly, truly love the UK. I consider it my, my second home, if I could actually say that. Uh, what I do want to say is uh, uh, I, I, I was uh, very, very disappointed with, uh, uh, the, um, with the result of the, of the referendum of the UK leaving the, the European Union, but it's absolutely uh, respected. What I do want to say, and I will not uh, uh, further my thoughts, is that my impression is that by leaving the UK, you, you shut one door. So you might have a bit less opportunities than if you were uh, within the European Union. Of course, uh, the UK is extremely uh, important, uh, an important country uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of global innovation. So I don't think it will be uh, very much affected regarding uh, technology transfer as uh, Alki's uh, uh, wrote in the question. But I do think that uh, uh, having open doors with the European Union, uh, uh, even if you were a member of the European Union, uh, there would have been increased chances of, uh, of synergies. This does not mean that there aren't opportunities now. Of course there are, and we should uh, uh, build uh, more bridges between the continent and, uh, and the UK in order to ensure that despite the fact the UK actually has decided to leave the Union, these opportunities are not lost. Okay, thank you, Christian. Then, next question, please. We, we, we have a, a related question. It's, it's directed initially, uh, uh, Christos, is from Ali Najimi. And the question is, as a, uh, a member of the knowledge transfer community at the university, and having worked uh, in um, uh, large corporate um, company before, question is, how can UK institutions, whether universities or companies, uh, can interact with Greek institutions if they need their expertise? And the same goes um, with US for Chrissy. And where should they start to look for information for potential partnerships? This is actually an, uh, an excellent question. And I, I, I don't want to say it actually links uh, very well to what I stated before. Um, EU countries do not have uh, it's not usual to have bilateral agreements in research and innovation. So it's actually the, the outstanding exception of two EU countries having a bilateral agreement, a framework agreement uh, on research and innovation, which allows universities, research centers, even companies to run bilateral programs. Uh, I'm actually now uh, considering with the uh, with, uh, ambassador uh, here in, in, in Greece, the UK ambassador, of, um, of uh, seeing how we can build such a bilateral agreement between the UK and Greece in order to allow, to, 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 to place a, 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 a formal framework which will enable such, uh, such synergies between uh, Greek universities uh, and the UK universities. So Greece does have such bilateral agreements with countries uh, like the, the USA, China, uh, Russia, Israel. Um, but uh, the exception is that you don't need them within the EU where you have uh, such a framework provided by the union as such. So uh, we are working on it uh, in order to build such an uh, agreement which will allow bilateral projects uh, having a, a stable and coherent framework uh, for more uh, uh, cooperations between institutions in the two countries. And uh, Chris, I think you wanted to add something on, on the US part. Yes, yes. So on, on the US part and, um, you know, there, uh, my, my, my experience is that, is, is that there are many opportunities 
for, for university team members to collaborate um, with, with companies like, like my own, as well as with, uh, you know, private and public sector, um, what I would consider clients. Um, you know, one of the primary ways that happens is actually just through networking. It's through industry um, organizations, you know, much like we're doing here. It's, it's just, um, I, know, I know when I was early on in my career, that was foundational to the direction that, that I took was to get that, that rich interaction with, with different organizations to, um, you know, ensure that, that we, don't, we don't suffer from groupthink, as Elspeth put it before. That, that we do reach out and, and, and have those connections. And it's something that, that I know in my company, we encourage at all levels of our staff, um, but particularly we have you know, senior experts that represent different specializations, different parts of our business that, that, are, that, are, that their job is to um, maintain those industry contacts, you know, including with universities. We actually regularly collaborate, you know, and, and the mechanism by which we collaborate might vary. Um, you know, it might be a research consortium that's developed to, um, you know, put all partners kind of on, a, on, a, on an equal playing field in terms of the legal requirements and, um, uh, you know, protecting uh, trade secrets, you know, as well as there's lots of other ways to do it behind a teaming agreement, something as simple as a teaming agreement or a joint venture or whatever. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that, you know, b- beyond the point of, Hey, I've got an idea. I want to explore it with you. Let's see if we can, you know, we can research this and then hopefully commercialize and monetize. Um, you know, that that's something that is certainly part of our strategy as a business, and I think it is for for many companies in the professional services space. And um, you know, what we like to do is look for universities that that are interested in doing more than one thing with us. You know, it, it takes time to build relationships and to establish that um, kind of those regular discussions and dialogue that, that are so key to, to progressing beyond just, you know, networking. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot that, that, that we look for in terms of, um, you know, even how we recruit and having those kind of multi-pronged relationships with universities where it's mutually beneficial. We can have, um, you know, a relationship with professors so that we can understand where their talent is, what their talent is looking for, and potentially introduce them to opportunities within the company, and, and um, as well as opportunities to collaborate on specific R&D, you know, possibly, you know, under IP or, or patent, or possibly just something that, um, you know, is for the benefit of, of the community, that, that's something that is part of good corporate citizenship. So, so there's a lot of ways to for university team members to engage with um, uh, companies in the U.S. Thanks, Chrissy. I mean, there's 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 a further question here, which is about should we cooperate uh, instead of um, compete uh, for technology transfer and to develop technologies? Who would like to have a go at that? Go on, Tim. I can just just share an experience. Um, it, an experience I was involved in was a collaborative uh, grouping for des- developing biotherapeutics, which the government set up. Um, and it was a collaboration partly funded by government, partly funded by industry. And it was a really funny first meeting. We all sat around, there were 50 of us, and none of the industry spoke to one another, and most of the academics didn't either, because we were all in the same space. And what my, reckon, my, my, my um, reflection was, was one, and this may be, um, uh, uh, I don't know it, whether it's a good idea, but with one, we met on a regular basis once every three months in a nice hotel. Uh, and, and, and actually, what was interesting about that is you started breaking bread together. So you basically started sharing other experiences. Um, and by the time we finished after the five year program, I expected the academics to start working better with industry, which we did. But what I also noticed was pharmaceutical companies competing, uh, uh, combining cooperatively. And, and, and I'd never seen that before. And if you've ever worked with a pharmaceutical company, they are some of the most competitive people out there because if they get the drug first, they win. But what we saw is collaboration and it was often on mechanisms of how to make stuff, manufacturing technologies and a benefit shared. So I, I, my, I would always go for collaboration, but what you find is often the legal people 
will try and stop you from doing that. That's my own experience because they worry about information leach. Chrissy sounds like oh, she's got an idea. Yeah, yeah. Just to to tag on to that, this is this is both within my my you know large company as well as just in the market. Like you said, yeah, there's some barriers with maybe risk aversion, particularly on the legal team that people like me are always going to push and push on. Um, but but it's also just visibility. It's as simple as somebody over here doesn't know that somebody over here has already invented that wheel. And all they have to do is get together and, you know, they could, they could combine their powers and do so much more. And so, you know, I found that, and to, to Tim's example, which is brilliant, that's perfect. It's just a matter of this casual conversations. It's not always the formal agenda where you're, you know, where you know what you're going to talk about. Sometimes you need to play a little bit with, you know, where those collaborations are. And there is a human element to it. Those relationships and, and that trust is part of, of how you get there in terms of, you know, that, that debate of, you know, do I go it alone and compete or do I, do I join, join up and, and be stronger as a result? Elizabeth, I think you wanted to have a go at this as well. Yeah, just, I think one of the things which I found really interesting moving from being sort of right at the heart of the infrastructure and construction sector to being much more on the digital side is, I think that collaboration is just a fundamental principle of many digital companies. If you think about the way that GitHub works, if you think about the way we're talking about open data, there's a real principle about borrowing from others, but also providing back to the community. And I think that is something which is absolutely fundamental within the digital realm, which I haven't always seen so much in the construction side. I think one of the things which we should think about around collaboration there's also a cultural barrier at some times. So people, it's almost like the toothbrush effect. People love their own idea. They don't want to borrow someone else's. And so I think when we think about collaboration, it's not just about sharing your ideas, but also being willing to take someone else's ideas and use them as well. So I think collaboration has to be two way. Um, I think we have another, we have about 10 minutes left. So then maybe a couple of more questions. Okay, let me try this one. This is relating to industry and academia uh, collaboration and, and working together. So the ex a question from Mark is, while universities are sources of transferable technology, technology consulting groups occupy the space between companies and technical advances, or at least it's Mark's observation. The question is, should technology transfer combine these skill sets especially as universities may be better involved in responding to industrial challenges from industry. Okay. And maybe Tim, Chrissy? Yeah, I'll offer a perspective to start with and then let, let Tim build on it. So, you know, I, I started addressing that question a little bit because I saw it, I saw it come through in, in one of my answers, but but maybe just to build on that a little bit, um, you know. So so if I understand the, the the question correctly, you know, there there's a distinction between what's happening at universities, um, and, and perhaps there's there's this view of of technology consulting entities being kind of in the middle, is the way the question sounds. And then, you know, perhaps the monetization and the commercialization and the productization is kind of over here is, is the way I'm interpreting the question. And I absolutely think that there's a role there. You know, it goes back to the statement I made earlier that, you know, we can't be everything to everybody. We need to know our strengths and focus on that. So there is certainly an opportunity. And, and actually we, we have active projects we're working on right now where we're doing that. Um, you know, in my vernacular, we, you know, sometimes we describe this relationship as a third party vendor. So, you know, we, um, you know, we're collaborating. Um, I think in this case, this was something that, that our team had worked with a client directly, um, you know, an idea that, that added value to, to, to their organization. And so we, you know, look at the requirements of that, think about, you know, what envision kind of what a minimum viable product might look like for, um, you know, meeting the, meeting the client's goals. And then recognize that, that some, sometimes it's more efficient to, um, you know, bring in a third party vendor to then 
um, help you define kind of how you do take that from prototype to something that's you know at least at, at least the next the next stage gate the next advancement so that you can you know evaluate again and see if it is something that you want to productize and scale so you know in that relationship and it's and it's different because you know sometimes depending on you know kind of what the what the product is how much in-house expertise there is um, you know what the what the um, um, the plan is in terms of how you commercialize that for a business those are all things that we think about we think about return on investment if it's something that is important for our client um, you know we also have to make sure that we can sustain ourselves as a business so that you know it's not something that we are going to have a business case around that the client is not going to be you know willing to pay for it might be the greatest thing ever but we have to make sure that we're not going to you know basically, you know, lose money as a business. So, you know, that is, the, that is the view that we take. And so if it means that we can partner with a technology consulting firm to, um, you know, focus on a part of it, focus on that development, we're absolutely going to do that. Tim? Yes, yeah, I mean, I think and life sciences were behind you um, very much. I mean, I, I, um, the government really supported this sort of activity in life sciences through um, organizations called Knowledge Transfer Networks, and it never really worked. Um, and, and in fact, my past, my experience, say five years ago, would be if you were phoned up by an agency with some techn saying asking for some technology, say for a pharma firm, the, the university's view would be they're probably snake oil, snake oil salesmen. Please don't talk to them and, and tell us that you you've been contacted. Um, my most recent experience is much more positive, which is a more open discussion, and um, particularly with IP licensing, which is more my area. Um, and, and actually discussions about revenue sharing and percentages and all the things that you need, the grease you need to allow the agency sector to grow, because actually it's not there really for us. And I, I think it's really valuable. I mean, you need people who take time to understand the problems and people who take time to understand where the skills are and then mesh the two together. And that can really accelerate stuff. So I think there's opportunities, but in our sector, I think we're way behind you guys. Okay, I think we're coming close to the end of our session. So maybe one quick question and a quick response then, and then we'll do the uh, closing remarks. Okay, there's an interesting one that a couple of uh, the attendees has ra have raised, and it's relating to uh, the skills required within the workforce, academia and industry to encourage knowledge transfer. So there's a remark that you know, in terms of hardware, software, uh, it's a relatively easier transfer process, but how do you grow the organization or one industry to accept a technology transfer from another for a quick uh, embrace adoption and actually get the benefits early? Who would like to take and any experiences uh, on this as well? Elspeth, yes, please. So I think one of the things which is really important for technology transfer is having people who can act as almost translators and who can work between different industries. So one of the challenges that we often have is one of specialism. So become as people become more senior in their career, they become more and more and more specialist in one specific area. That's hugely valuable. But we also need the people who are the generalists who can communicate in different languages. So can speak to an academic or speak to a policymaker or speak to somebody in a completely different sector. And those are the people that we really need to harness, train up and support because they're quite unusual in organizations and they don't always naturally fit within organizations. And I think, think for me, for innovation to thrive, we need to really find and focus on these translators. Right, thank you very much. Um, right, unfortunately, we are reaching the end of the session. I, I feel that um, the technology transfer field is, is so wide that we could debate in over it for hours to come. Uh, so perhaps we could arrange a, a series of follow-up sessions. This is something we uh, discussed with Tim a couple of weeks ago as well. Uh, so if, if our audience, of course, feel that they would like to hear more on the subject, and we will send out um, forms, uh, feedback forms that you can fill in and, and tell us your opinion on that. Um, so when we 
when we had our test event a couple of days ago, Elspeth asked me an exceptional question. I think it went along the lines of um, what is the outcome you'd like to achieve from this panel discussion? And uh, I responded by saying that I'd like our audience to be offered the opportunity to, to explore with us this wide topic of technology transfer, um, you know, which is something that in my opinion goes beyond the typical commercialization of universities research. Uh, and, and by sharing the experience of, of people who, who shape technology transfer um, tonight, that our audience, I hope that our audience um, would appreciate how investment in this sector can help stimulate the global economies. So hopefully we've managed to provoke some further thinking amongst yourselves uh, and, and get you interested in, in hearing more in the future from, from that. Um, in terms of next month uh, event, we have, let me see if I can share my screen briefly. So we have a February and not January there, apologies for the typo. Um, 10th of February, we have electric air racing um, and it is followed by a recognizing and removing unconscious bias, promoting inclusivity in March with Angela Saini, who's a, a broadcaster and author. Um, if you would like to get involved, then all you have to do is uh, contact us. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers at uh, IT London, uh, and, and you can share there your comments on our Twitter feed. Uh, and anything else thoughts you have from the event. Um, as I said, you will be um, offered uh, a feedback form that we would be grateful if you could uh, fill in. It actually helps us shape for our, our program for the events to come. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to thank once again our participants, Chrissy, Elspeth, uh, Christo and Tim uh, and of course, my colleague Zen for helping out with the Q&A session. Uh, all of you that joined in uh, and also Duncan Kenyon from the IIT set that helped us uh, put together the event uh, with uh, the panelists. So we hope you enjoyed your time here and perhaps we can host you again in the near future on another of our events. Thank you all for that day, att attending, stay safe and happy new year.